Okay, welcome to the CES meeting. It is September 7 of 2022. Uh, we have two topics on the agenda. Uh, Peter is going to share an update on conversations that uh, have been had about records and tuples, um, followed by Leo joining us after a, a long hiatus. Welcome back um, uh, to discuss updates on Shadow Realms. Next week is plenary and uh, if we get a little bit of time toward the end, we'll take a look at what's on the agenda and make sure that there's uh, nothing in our blind spots. Um, Peter, go ahead, please. Sorry, I have to unmute in four places. Um, yeah, just uh, in brief, um, the records and tuples work, um, which I, I've Modable has been kind of disengaged with um, for a while, has kind of uh, come back on our radar, um, I think as a consequence of the fact that um, it was they, their stated intention to ask for stage three at the next plenary. Um, that brought back um, the fact that Modable had uh, kind of only agreed to stage two with reservations um, and was specifically with objections to the fact that records and tuples were new primitives rather than adding immutability, uh, deep immutability, however you want to define that, as a uh, characteristic uh, of objects, um, perhaps by doing something like extending the integrity levels as uh, has, has been discussed um, on the reflector. And um, that um, that came back up as a result of some implementation work, I guess, that had been done on on Spider Monkey, um, and and some conversations with folks there. Um, and so uh, we're we're coming back to that. And it, it seems, I mean, it seems like there's some some room for that for that view to be to be explored again. And it, it seems very relevant to uh, the overall SES. Uh, and hardened JavaScript uh, efforts um, because um, more consistent support, uh, more thorough support for immutability um, through the language uh, is, is would seems obviously beneficial here. And so I, um, I mostly just wanted to make folks aware that that was uh, that was ongoing. Um, and it seems like an opportunity to um, consider what are the, the kind of baseline requirements um, for SES, like what would we want to see? Um, for example, from Audible's perspective, from a, we would be content if the language only um, provided a way um, normatively to create um, deeply frozen objects and arrays. Um, that were type of object and array, um, but that um, but that the mechanisms in the language um, would work if there were deeply mutable objects of other types, such as date, that were created um, through non-normative means. Um, and so that would allow us to have su consistent support in the language for any type being deeply immutable and to know how to expect it to behave. Um, but that the language would only go through the effort at this point in time of defining it for for as few as two objects, which happen to be the ones in the current proposal. Uh, I so you lost me with the uh, let's take the date example. So sure. so I mean espe date especially because date is part of uh, the language standard. It's not something that hosts provide. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's. So say again what you're proposing with regard to just focusing in on the date example. Sure. I mean, let me, uh, it's great you pick a, a, an example that, that we handled today in, in excess. So I can kind of explain, I can explain it in that context. So we can today in excess take an instance of date and put it in ROM, at which point it is profoundly immutable. Um, and how that object gets into ROM and is immutable is is absolutely like just magic from the access linker perspective. It's not even in the language, but but the object exists and is is fully deeply immutable in every possible way. Um, so we want the language when it rec when it sees such a language to behave such an instance to behave in a consistent way. Um, so for example, if there was a way to check that an object is deeply immutable, 
um, you know, is whatever, like the, the moral equivalent of is frozen, is whatever, um, when applied to such an instance, it would return true, just like it would for a deeply frozen object or a deeply frozen array. Okay. Um, but, uh, I apologize that I keep forgetting the name, but what is the current name for the purity checking predicate, that, or not, not predicate, the thing that reveals the list of of violation paths, but but that you can use as a predicate for purity. I think it was going to be called impurities, but I think it may still be called purify in the actual implementation. Okay, let's let's go with impurities, because um, uh, that that also makes it clear that what it does when it fails is it gives you the the list of of reasons for failure, um, uh, and it so. So, so, so something like impurities, um, uh, a predicate, something that can be used as a predicate would be part of the standard. Uh, and it would say yes or no on a date exactly according to whether or not the date actually were deeply immutable. Uh, and uh, then you're uh, further proposing, okay, so are you proposing a new integrity level that is part of the semantic state of an object, or are you proposing that for uh, records, for, for, neuro, for plain objects, I'm gonna call them records. Um, uh, no, I shouldn't call them records in this context. <laughs> uh -huh. um, for, plain, for plain objects uh, very, um, and arrays, uh, would you just be checking that they're frozen and then, and then checking recursively, or would you be looking for a new integrity level? I so I'm not proposing anything um, at the moment. Um, I I think it requires a new integrity level to meet the um, the goals of the the current proposal. So I think in both cases it would need to check for a further integrity level. Okay. Um, I, I I think, but I I don't want to speak for them. That's why I say I don't. I I'm not at the point of proposing a specific solution. Okay. Well, implementation. so so let's. I'm not. I'm not talking about implementation. I'm still talking just about, uh, you know, normative. What what would be in a normative proposal? Um, a a new integrity level would clearly be a specification issue, independent mm -hmm. of implementation. Um, uh, so, if there was an operate, if there was a new integrity level, then there would need to be a new operation for bringing about the new integrity level. Mm -hmm. uh, and if there's an operation for bringing about the new integrity level, then is there any reason, you know, and if the new integrity level is something that, that um, the predicate applied to dates might say the date is immutable or the date is mm -hmm. pure, uh, is there any reason not to, not to specify that the operation for bringing about the new integrity level operates on dates and as a result of operating on the date, the result of uh, successfully operating a date produces, you know, brings the puts the date into that new integrity level uh, at, uh, at which point it becomes pure. So this, um, this gets into to ground that, um, that I think you, Mark, in fact, had, had kind of scared us off from because you, you and I, I may be misrepresenting you here. So, you know, feel free to correct me, but, um, the, I mean, that's freeze, like making the internal slots of an object immutable. I think you described it as an attack where if you were to do that, like to the private fields of something um, of an instance, that would be a problem. Um, yeah. Yes, uh, that's, that's, that's all true, okay. uh, but that doesn't mean that it's, um, that just means that, that we, we need to be careful about under what circumstances the operation succeeds or fails. Mm -hmm. uh, if so, for, so let's just go through cases for mm -hmm. a, a a plain object or an array. You can already freeze it. Mm -hmm. So being able to just looking at it shallowly, mm -hmm. being able to uh, purify it, or or um, would not be doing for a plain object or an array something that you couldn't do already. It would just be marking it with a, with a new distinction that new, that new operations could 
uh, test, but not, mm -hmm. but not otherwise uh, changing what you could do. Now for date, um, it is true that dates themselves um, uh, don't have a, um, you know, don't currently have any notion of, of, be, of being non-modifiable. Uh, and then, so it's now, now a question about, uh, are we willing to just have it be part of the semantics of the date that it can make, that a mutable date can make a transition to being a non-mutable date? Mm -hmm. uh, and then the big question, which I think goes to the heart of, 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 of what you're asking, is uh, for instances of classes, um, the, uh, the class is written by a class author to um, you know, provide a set of defensive services such that they can be shared by multiple clients without the clients being able to damage the shared service and thereby damage each other. So, uh, so, it, so in that case, it doesn't matter whether you say that the operation for bringing about the new integrity level comes from the implementation or the host or the language. In all three cases, uh, if you allow it, it would be an attack. Uh, if the class itself doesn't do something to opt into it. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I don't think it helps to say, don't provide it as an operation in the language, let's move it, move it to implementation or host discretion. Uh, if, if it's an attack, you can't allow the implementation of the host to enable the attack either. Um, if it's an attack, but if it's in, uh, like if it's, a, if it's all a trusted execution environment and everybody's opted in, then it's fine, right? Well, okay, so then there comes to be the question of, okay, so somebody authors a class, how does the author, how does the class code that they authored opt in to being purified? Mm -hmm. And if there's a way for the class code to opt in, then you don't need a, a overall trusted execution environment. You just need the opt-in signal. And once you have the opt-in signal from the, from the, you know, the class code doing something explicit, mm -hmm. then you can have it be part of the language that it refuses to pu purify classes that have not opted in. Mm -hmm. And it is happy to purify classes that have opted. Sure. Matthews and I, I have a lot of questions. <laughs> um, so from when I, um, so to, to the first point uh, that was just discussed here, uh, yes, very much, I don't want to see uh, something like freeze where uh, the engine would uh, impose something on a target object uh, without consent. So something based on a protocol uh, would make a lot more sense for me. But then that raises the next question. Um, I ask you to uh, purify yourself, make you, uh, I like the concept of more of inert, uh, so that like if I interact with you, I know nothing else, nothing's gonna happen. Um, the, how, who's in charge of enforcing that? Uh, if the target can lie, yeah, sure, I'm, I'm not pure, uh, whatever you do to me, uh, nothing is gonna change. Um, who actually is in charge of enforcing that at that point? And are engines capable of doing that? I know XS uh, has a lot of, uh, as the impurities uh, check, uh, I doubt other engines would be able or willing to do similar, uh, similar checks. Um, there's a lot of ways someone can build an object that ends up uh, Having an effect, a side effect, uh, when 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 interacted with, uh, proxies is obviously one of them, uh, and so on. Like how uh, I have a hard time seeing how you can make an object pure, so that the engine would enforce that any interaction with the object would not execute any user code that has a recorded effects uh, uh, I, so i 
I mean, having having done it in a previous language, I think I think that it's straightforward. Um, so I'm, I'm puzzled while you're puzzled. In the case of a proxy, uh, there's there's uh, two two. I think there's two clear choices, both of which uh, we should you know examine. One is that um, uh, well one one choice that has some sort of, some big downsides, but is a, a choice to examine is that the uh, proxies can simply um, not be purifiable, in which case the uh, attempt to purify them always fails and the impurities check on them always says it's not pure because it's a proxy. The big downside of that is of course, you lose practical membrane transparency. It violates the whole transparency goal of proxies. Right. Um, uh, the other uh, the other thing you could do for proxies is to say, well, if the target is pure and the handler is pure, then the proxy is pure. Yeah, but again, that, that relies on a purity predicate, which I have my doubts that engines would be able to implement. Maybe XS can, but I, I don't know about other engines. I, I mean, I always think of XS as like the weakest engine on the block. And if we can do something like then these like monstrous, awesome hulking beasts from these giant companies with infinite resources can do it. Cause, cause yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I mean, I, I don't want to speak for them, but I always assume that if, if we can pull something off, like for sure they can too. I mean, you you pulled off uh, <laughs> a, a better weak maps, uh, and uh, we've not managed to convince anybody else that uh, that yours are better. So, <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, we're... We, we we will. We need to. We need to. You know, we're up. But this is T C thirty nine. We have to take a long term perspective on these things. Uh, now that one engine has a much better weak map that has better complexity measure, um, a a a a benchmark that makes that visible and more and more deployed programs like what Agoric is building that work well on XS and work painfully bad on something else for, re for, for reasons that jump out in a benchmark, uh, that brings about pressures. And the pressures work both ways. It also works against Agoric if we work badly on V8. But, um, uh, but that, was, that was how WASM1 was through ASM.js working right. well on Mozilla and badly on V8. So to get back to the problem here, would one solution would be like, so if the object through the protocol claims now that uh, it is pure, any further interaction that is recorded on the object in, the, in an internal slot and any further interaction with that object uh, can, like without having a preemptive check, would it be possible to mark the execution involving that object as having to be pure so that if it touches uh, or tries to modify any other object after that uh, execution throws or something like that? Well, you'd have to throw, throws as a recoverable condition. You'd have to, you know, terminate the entire, the entire engine. Um, you know, as we've talked about for, for OOM, um, uh, out of memory, uh, situations where you can't maintain invariance that you must maintain, the only option is to destroy the world. Um, uh, but uh, it would just never occur. I mean, the thing that the integrity level, I think, was the right concept to start from. An integrity level is something that is not according to the object, it's according to the engine. I mean, the whole presumption is that uh, objects can lie. And if you want to count on a property, then it should be the engine that enforces the property, and, and the object shouldn't be able to claim the property unless the engine can back it. Yeah. It's in that all this relies on a preemptive purity check that I have extreme doubts can be so, turned so, out. So, 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 I end, so there's, there's, I want to separate the question of extreme doubts because I think you mix two issues together that need to be separated. Um, uh, the, the, um, the proxy issue is, a, a, you know, as a standalone question can be examined in the you know the hypothetical where for all the plain non-problematic cases we can do the integrity level and we can do the check that the engine stands for and then having taken care of sort of a baseline where you've done the non-problematic cases then you say okay given that we've done the non-problematic cases can we do the problematic cases 
So in the, in the proxy case, if we've taken care of the non-problematic cases, then I think a proxy in which the target is pure and the handler is pure, it's not, pro it's not hard to say that the proxy is pure and to have the engines and to have that be a real guarantee. Sure. I mean, yeah, proxy was an example. Uh, yeah, the reason I, I took the proxy example is because it, it, we couldn't make the simplification of if it's an object that has only data uh, properties and is frozen and so on, um, you know, avoiding the whole accessor uh, complexity. That that's one way of saying an object is pure if it if it is not a proxy, doesn't doesn't have any uh, accessors uh, throughout, then that object is pure. Uh, yeah. I yeah, I mean, in fact, I think I think that what it's going to come down to in terms of how hard it is for actual implementations of this is this is a speculation. I'm not an engine builder. I haven't been for for a very long time before I ever heard of JavaScript. Um, but my let me let me propose the hypothesis that that really all of the problems for the fancier engines are going to come down to closure optimization. Um, that if you want a uniform rule about whether a closure is pure or not, then you need a uniform rule about what variables it captures. Uh, and having the runtime representation of closures um, uh, reflect any kind of, of cross-engine agreement about what variables are captured, that seems to me to be the most likely sticking point. Other than that, I don't see likely sticking points. Um with scope and with with, with so uh, with scope you just say anything any lexical variable that um, that goes through a with block is not pure and any attempt to purify it fails and any attempt to test it for purity says it's not pure right I mean you've, you've always got the out um, unless you're running into another, criteria like membrane transparency, you always have the out of saying, okay, this, this problematic case, we're just always going to say it's impure. And what about uh, the just the global uh, context? The uh, global context, the, um, uh, the, this, the, the, global ver the global object itself, you know, the, the, um, uh, that, uh, that one, uh, I don't, does the spec itself say anything about the nature of the object that can serve as the, the this global or is it only? Host defined. Sorry? It's entirely host defined. Entirely host defined. So it could be a plain object. Yes. As, but far, as, the, code. as far as the spec is concerned. Yes, we know in practice it isn't. Okay. Well, so what that means is that if it's host defined, then the then the host, you know, what object it is is host defined, and and if it's if the host provides an object that can't be purified, well, then the that object can't be purified, um, and with regard to the object itself, that's the end of the story, uh, and with regard to global variables, um, uh, the 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 spec puts uh, tight constraints on. You know, if you've got a if you've got a const global variable that's not terminated in the global object that's terminated in the global lexical scope that has none of these problems, so I think I think you just say that it's you know if the host provides a uh, not purifiable global object, well then the global object's not purifiable. Yeah, yeah. I think that's going to be another place for pushback from uh, other delegates that we know of the browser environment, which obviously provides a global object that is not purifiable. Um, so if, if it's a feature that is off limits, completely off limits because of that for the whole web, I- No, it's not. It's, it's only, only for, for, for something that depends on the global environment, which is almost nothing. I mean, global object. If, it, if it's dependent on the global object, if it captures the global object, then it's not purifiable. Almost nothing captures the global object. 
Ah, right. Everything uh, consults the global object, though, for intrinsics. Yeah. Um, it's a smaller problem, right? Oh, what about evaluator in that case? In, in any case, um, I think that we have a pretty good idea of the shape of the problem at this point. Is this a good time to segue to Leo's topic? Yeah, I mean, I would um, just just to to kind of bring it bring it back to um, to Mark's question. I think Mark, the, I mean, th this is um, these kinds of questions are why I think um, from Modable's perspective, we would be willing to accept an initial normative solution um, that um, that doesn't try to describe um, that doesn't try to solve all these problems. Um, but but lays the groundwork for them to being addressed down the line or to be be addressed by the host. Um, so, so the addressed by the, the, the things that that really are conceptually language issues, leaving those to host discretion is something that I strongly object to. Yeah, no, that's right. That's not what I was trying to suggest. I I, I mean I think very strongly what Maudible wants to see is that immutability is handled, is, is, is more fully defined by the language and is, is consistently applied across objects. That's okay. what we want. Uh, what we're saying is the ability to make where we're, where we're, where we think it's practical to limit that is to what types of objects you can currently make immutable and, and, make that make it that new integrity level and what what you said and what you described for example with proxy is exactly where we are like any mechanism that would let you say make this object deeply immutable at this new integrity level could fail and the cases on which it could fail could be reduced over time based on additional work on the language so the reduced over time um the uh, maybe uh, we need to be careful about that, but but it is the case that turning errors into non-errors, especially in areas that you anticipate, is um, one of the 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 kinds of change over time that we tend to get away with. Right. That is what I was thinking. Is like the usual thing is if something has always been an error and we now allow it, then um, yeah. that's acceptable, especially if it was was kind of designed that way. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's so. So I, I agree with that. Um, just want to keep as much of it in the language as possible, mm -hmm. um, and as much of it as deterministic as possible. Uh, yeah. At least deterministic as of any one generation of the spec. Yeah. And I mean, the idea of having a, a protocol that would allow a class to opt into this is great with us. Um, right. I, I, you know, to other people <laughs> may have different opinions. And so that's just an example of, of where I think pragmatism and, and having uh, extensibility down the line may be, may be the right answer. Uh -huh. So if you start with plain objects and plain arrays, um, how do you deny proxies acting like them? from being uh, used without revealing, without providing a predicate allowing to de detect proxies. So that, that's my, yeah. Yeah. Um, so anything that you do that, that, that does not include proxies is gonna be a compromise. Uh, but, you know, using the principle that Peter just stated, about spec evolution, you could say that as of a given version of the spec, it fails on proxies. And therefore, as of that version of the spec, you could use it to reveal a proxy, but it's explicitly the case that the plan is to grow the language to where that error case becomes a non-error, which means that programs whose correctness is supposed to last beyond a given version of the language spec uh, uh, will, uh, should, you know, um, cannot correctly use this to detect proxies because it will then fail to detect proxies in a later version of the language. I don't like that, but it is consistent with everything we just said. And then there is the other elephant in the room, which is equality uh, and usage of values as 
so it's not just equality and equality predicate. It's also like where that equality predicate is used. Uh, for example, if you want to use one of those immutable objects as a uh, map or in a map or a set as a key, um, it's an old extension to to those containers to be able to like recognize to make it equivalent to record in tuples to recognize two uh, immutable values as uh, as equal for that usage. Okay, so I so I think that that you know what I would strongly advocate if we go in this direction is that unlike records and tuples, we do not make the these things just be compared as structurally equal. Uh, you according to the existing equality predicates. This is the main motivation. I, of the I, I, I understand that. And, and we discussed that last time when we talked about deep equality. A consequence of introducing new deep equality operators is that um, you, know, the, the, you lose one of the main motivators for records and tuples, uh, which I'm willing to lose, by the way, uh, which is that you're not extending the equality behavior of existing um, existing abstractions like maps and sets. Instead, you would have to introduce some new variant on maps and sets that use the new deep equality uh, because the, the integrity level should not, I would not want, if we're, if we're, if, you know, the thing about this direction is this integrity level should not imply the loss of identity. And if the objects have identity, then they're not like records and tuples and the existing equality operators have to compare their identity. Now, right. it, it, it does, it, with regard to defining a deep equality operator, new integrity level does solve the, the hardest problem that we dealt with last time, which is knowing when to stop. We could say that the, that the new deep equality operator is exactly entangled with the new integrity level to where it's deep just through objects with this new integrity level and stops when that when that integrity level runs out. I'm confused. Does this mean you can have objects that are uh, with that integrity level up to a certain point? How do you expect exits in 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 your object graph at that point? Right. I'm sorry. I was I was mixing up this with something we haven't talked about, and that if I raise it, we're not going to get to Leo's question. Let me just mention it as a marker to come back to another time, which is um, the, it would be useful to have a non-transitive version of the new integrity level, um, which is just sort of a, a, you know, I'll just call it a super freeze for lack of a better term, um, but that does things like freezing dates and does things like um, uh, freezing uh, class instances that have opted in to being frozen, uh, but is not by itself transitive. And then you have uh, the other, the, then the transitive test is just uh, a, a, a transitive, a test for the transitivity of the application of this new super freeze. If it's super freeze transitively, then it's pure. Um, and the other, the, the reason why I th some kind of super freeze, I think is something I'd really like, I, I would really like some excuse to get some way to turn off the override mistake. So if you super freeze an object, then its frozen properties are not subject to the override mistake. Mm -hmm. And then the super, then then the deep integrity level, sorry, then the deep equality could be transitive through super freeze, but if it ever runs out, if it ever, if there's ever anything that's not super frozen, then the whole thing is not pure. Mm -hmm. I have added a topic by the title "super freeze" by Mark um, to the list of things to visit at future meetings. Yeah. Um, is this a good time to segue? Yeah. All right, Leo. You have the floor. I have the floor, but then I have the system permissions to share my screen. You do not have permission to share the screen. Uh, not yet. 
Uh, oh, you mean your operating system's permissions? Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you have my permission, Leo. That should be enough. <laughs> I have no idea what's going on here. And uh, because Apple shows us I do have permission. Like, I have the checkbox for Zoom. I cannot share my slides. Have you tried turning it off and on? So sorry about this. <laughs> All right. While you're while you blink away for a moment, I think um, uh, I'll share uh, the agenda topics for plenary, or at least put them up on my screen until you're ready. I think this is the correct browser window. Um, Matthew mentioned that uh, one of the things that's coming up is explicit resource management for stage three. We haven't had a chance to look at it, but. Uh, we probably ought to. My feeling on this is, uh, so last time we uh, looked at this, Matthew had uh, proposed that we already had explicit resource management. All you have to do is a clever hack of a for loop, um, which I love. Um, but on the other hand, I'm kind of I'm kind of warm to the idea of having something like go defer, which appears to be what this proposal is. Um, we just need to take a look at it and see whether it's bad got it here. to to be uh, to be precise last time uh our main concern was um uh, asynchronous interleaving points uh that were not uh marked by syntax were not obviously marked by syntax uh, right. so we're uh, like everything we don't like syntax new syntax but if uh it's limited uh there might be it, it might be good enough so just need to look at what the new shape is Right. So if we take a look at this, we'll be looking for whether um, whether uh, the the resource cleanup function, if it is if it has an await within it, then the then the uh, the the using or defer equivalent has to have a marker as well. Yeah. Okay. Matthew, could you add your time constraints to the agenda, uh, specifically that you would like to attend? Ron's session on this specifically. Will do. Thank you. Okay. Let's see. Uh, this is this is the topic that I am most interested in: um, refactoring of import-related host hooks. Um, this is uh, Nicolo's fabulous pull request uh, to the spec that paves the way for all of the module proposals to be simplified. Um, that is to say, moving the transitive exploration of the dependency graph from HTML. To 262. Um, and I'm uh I, I can happily report that I saw a message yesterday from Dominic saying that he has been converted from skeptic to um supporter for this proposal. Um, and, and the proposal by itself does not require any implementation to actually change anything, correct? It's just a different way of codifying existing conformant behavior. Uh, I can't answer that question. My in, my impression is that the changes to 262 are at least close to not breaking anything. And the HTML changes might break something a little, but not a lot. Um, and that I think that the browser vendors are open to it, but I don't, I again, I can't answer the question. It might, the answer might be yes. Okay, great. Um, and if it's no, it's not a big no. Um, yeah, so Intel, go, go ahead. I was just going to say I have it ready here. OK, Anytime cool. Then let's, uh, let's, uh, let's come back to this after your topic. All yours. OK, thank you. Can you see my Safari screen? No, I see Leo has started screen sharing. Well, I thought I have it ready. So sorry about this. Can you see my full screen? Yes. 
Okay, so full screen works. Um, okay, so this is a quick presentation. I'm gonna skip the parts where I reintroduce like what is about Shadow Realms. Um, so uh, pretty much like slides here are just showing like what Shadow Realms is. Um, there's a quick example here on uh, how we do use uh, Shadow Realms at Salesforce. As like considering like a, a one use case for accessible web applications, I'm gonna be fast here to make time. Uh, so for these web uh, accessible web applications, we have like our Salesforce internal components, and we have custom components tailored by the customers, uh, which is in case is like what we usually call as uh, first to third party uh, and especially as third party, we have the app exchange, which is our uh, Salesforce marketplace for plugins and extensions. Let's say you have components that will show, uh, will display the items you have. And this is what we talk when we discuss trusted uh, third party components. And uh, with the Shadow Realms, we can have improved, uh, improved integrity. Uh, previously, I also mentioned like improved integrity and security, but I don't want to mention this word FTC39 because you know, like it will call it, it will derail uh, the discussion where I wanted to to go. Uh, but uh, yes, it, it's also like improved integrity and security in, in the case of my applications. Um, the, it, yeah, in, integrity really is a fine word for covering that because. When you divide security into integrity, availability, and confidentiality, the port of, the portion of security that we're talking about here is exactly integrity. Yeah. And uh, then I reintroduced the Shadow Realm API, and I'm going to go with the status. Like the intention for this 39 meeting is to reintroduce, uh, like to give uh, an update on how is the current implementation. and. Uh, this is a reminder Salesforce is uh, sponsoring Igalia to ship Shadow Realms in web browsers. We did some work on WebKit. We uh, we included this work to some overview on the Chrome browser. There's a chance that might be invested in implementation, um, not defined yet. And implementation status so far, we do have Shadow Realms available in the Safari technology preview 142, also in Safari 16 beta uh, version. And uh, it's we do have a work in progress for Chrome. It's under a flag. You can find it on V8 through the Harmony Shadow Realm uh, flag. Um, and uh, it's also available under a flag in since Firefox 104. Is I see that a hand? on this slide that suggests that Peter might be able to answer a question for you. Oh, yeah. I don't have status yet for multiple access, and uh, I'm so sorry. Uh, yes, you failed to build uh, multiple locally here, so I couldn't get this information yet, but it's so good that we have Peter. Uh, yeah, not not something we've looked at, so um, just yeah, not I mean, there. Yeah, I mean, can, can I suggest that it's not something that you should look at? That, mm -hmm. that that the part of the whole point of the modable engine uh, is that it's um, it has no re need for multiple realms, uh, and it continues to have no need for multiple realms uh, uh, because it uh, supports hardened you know it supports hardened JavaScript. It has uh, full support for mutual suspicion within a realm. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, it's not something, I mean, like realms, exactly. We, we haven't supported realms and um, I mean, it's not, uh, it's not something on our radar. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, just for this case, it's not that I want to exclude a uh, multiple here, but I'm like, but for the sake of this uh, status update, I will have multiple removed here because do not derail like when I presented to, to C39. Sure. Once uh, that's fine. Thank you. And uh, I think uh, the HTML integration uh, in sharing the here, I think it's the last uh, big blocker that we have for uh, moving those implementations 
uh, to to get like them uh, without flags and everything. This is the my uh, the major milestone that is remaining. And you know, we do have work there, like we're sponsoring Egalia to, to continue this work and finish this HTML integration. So a uh, review was done, review was applied, and we need to get traction from uh, the maintainers of that pull request. And, uh, but it's still gonna make this clear here. This is like what I'm hoping to, uh, for us to get cleared and uh, move ahead with it. Um, we do have some new PRs. We have one editorial and we have some fixes. I will expand the slides uh, to, to tell we have the, like the error uh, handling and or uh, propagating uh, the error details. Uh, Caridi is working on it. I don't think that we're gonna have, uh, like they're both in reveal. And I don't think we, we can tell like we have well, everything ready to be merged onto this meeting. I don't want to assume that. Karidi is also like uh, taking some time off sick. Um, so until he recovers, I don't want to put pressure on it, uh, but we do have these errors. Uh, the, uh, these should address uh, the questions from Shu in the previous uh, presentations for, for realms and what we do with the errors. Um, so as like, I also don't have Karidi uh, availability right now, um, I am delayed on the slides to expand this, uh, this part. I hope to have some, some expansion on uh, at the meeting, for the TC39 meeting. Um, saying that, Karidi doesn't want to show this at TC39. I kind of like see the point, but I also like want to show because of the, the following slide as well. I intend to eventually bring in a follow-up proposal an expansion to Shadow Realms where we can have uh, the wrapped module namespace exotic objects for Shadow Realms, meaning we can have a import uh, method equivalent to the dynamic import um, that gets a wrapped module namespace exotic object. Uh, this is not even presented as stage zero or requesting stage one. This is just like it should remain stage zero uh, at this meeting next week. We need to make it like a full proposal document and bring it back to the CES meetings and eventually to a next TC39 meeting, but this is a trivial. Um, and funny enough, where I wanted to, to get the discussions here, uh, this is a bitter surprise for everyone. I'm so sorry to get everyone off guard. Um, so some Dutch laws are now uh, forbidding unsafe evil and unsafe lying. So and they're going to be considered uh, failures if they're used. Uh, we are working on it at Salesforce. <laughs> how we move these ahead and how we contour this. And also they say on, under certain conditions, this can be postponed to, until May 1st, 2024, which is pretty close. I'm sorry, I think I'm missing a joke. What is the, I, what is the it, Dutch issue? I'm not even saying it's a joke. This is kind of like a, a bitter surprise. I'm so sorry if it sounded as a joke. I kind of uh, laugh when I'm just nervous. Um, Incredulous lawmakers making decision and not understanding what they're talking about. Dutch laws are making a decision to consider unsafe evolve and safe line as uh, failures for servers and probably affecting oh. users. Yes, uh, of it. Wow. So uh, I know Karidi has been working on like uh, how to control this with trusted types and everything, but uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the link is here. I'm going to copy this link, uh, copy, uh, this link to the group. Trusted types, it. however, are only available in uh, Chrome slash V8, right? I don't think, did Firefox ever implement trusted types? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know the status of it. The link is here. It, 
those shows uh, in Dutch, but there is a translation, easy translation button to, to English. Um, you know who this applies to out of curiosity? Sorry? Do you know, I mean, an, an auditor, what is an RE auditor? Would, would is, does this rule apply to uh, as failing? Any website, government website probably, but... Uh, uh, I was informed of this yesterday. Uh, I'm bringing it here like as, like I just had like an internal discussions. I still, like we're still calling uh, legal at Salesforce to understand better like how this is going to be implied, like how this affects us, at, like how this infects us as uh, in legal. And we are still assessing like what we we need to do. So this is pretty early, like we, we just uh, heard of it, like at this moment, like we just had like our first internal call yesterday. Is this a proposed law or is this already a law? That's what I need legal to answer. It seems like it's already a decision. That's what I understand. I see. So it's good to have like also this group, like all the people interested in see, to see like how this will affect us. Oh my God. Where is it? Okay. It only works on, on Google Chrome to have the translate. Oh, sure. but, um, oh, um, and we'll take a look. Thank you. Um, if you can post a link, add this link to the agenda, we'll follow up. I'll, yes, I'll post it to, to the agenda. I posted and it to the chat, but I also posted it to the agenda. We're, we're one minute to time and we have a hard stop. Yeah, I think we have homework now, like everyone does. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. Thank you, Leo. Thank you. Um, okay. Yeah. Plenary is in Tokyo next week. I uh, hope to see you all there.